Um, my name is Alex Dunlap. I'm a manager on the uh, AWS Edge Services team. Um, this uh, presentation was supposed to be given by Nihar Bihani, uh, who is uh, part of our CloudFront team. So Edge Services is CloudFront, it's Route 53, it's AWS WAF, and it's uh, Elemental Technologies, our video uh, transcoding um, subsidiary, or video processing subsidiary. I um, used to run the CloudFront business, just moved down to work with the Elemental business about six months ago. Um, so Nihar got sick, and he asked me if I could give this talk for him. Uh, I said, sure, but I also asked Craig to, to join me. Uh, so Craig is a principal engineer on the Ed Services team. Um, so um, afterwards, I'm happy to answer any questions about either CloudFront, uh, Elemental, uh, AWS, anything uh, that you're interested in, so I'll stick around for that. Uh, what to expect today? Um, what we wanted to do today is spend a little bit of time talking about why security matters. Uh, this should be no surprise for most of you. We won't spend a ton of time here. Um, talk a little bit about how we think about security at AWS and how CloudFront, uh, Amazon Certificate Manager, and AWS WAF uh, kind of can help with the security. Um, the big thing I want to, you guys to take away today, um, a lot of times people get into decisions and they think of things in terms of binary, kind of either or decisions. Uh, so with security, frequently customers can think about, do I want my website to be secure or do I want it to perform well? And if I can accomplish one thing uh, with you guys here today, it's going to be, how do we get both of those things? How do we build websites that both secure, uh, are both highly secure and perform well? So it's not an either or, uh, it's, it's an and. And um, along with that, um, the title of the session is Offloading Some of the Heavy Lifting. A bunch of the concepts that we'll talk about here are very important to get right and not always the easiest thing to do to get right. Uh, so we're going to talk about ways that you can leverage AWS solutions uh, to manage some of those heavy lifting items so you're sure to get good security and security done right. So just briefly, um, why does security matter? Um, most importantly, it's customer trust. You know, customers come to our websites expecting that we're going to protect their information, keep it safe, and we need to live up to that trust. It can also be things like regulatory compliance. We'll talk a little bit about how different regulations and um, standards are increasingly putting security front and center. Uh, David pri data privacy is clearly a part of that. Uh, this is CloudFront, uh, sort of the overlay against the AWS security model. And so when we think about security at AWS, we tend to think of a shared responsibility model that has three components. There is the security of the infrastructure, there is the security of the services, and there is the security of the applications that you build. So infrastructure, uh, examples of security there could be things like PCI compliance. Um, on the services in CloudFront, we'll talk today about th things that you can do with SSL and TLS. We'll talk about our private content features. We'll talk about AWS WAF, CloudTrail, some of the service configurations. And then there's a whole bunch of things that you can do in your applications, and we'll cover some of these, that will make those applications more secure um, without sacrificing performance. So the way we've basically structured this talk is looking at a combination of things that CloudFront does for you. These are the things that you get um, by default, by using CloudFront, um, plus a set of things that you can do. What can I do with my CloudFront configuration? What features does CloudFront make available to help um, make your website more, more secure? Uh, make your content more secure. And what we will hopefully end up with here is a, um, some practical ways that you can secure your content uh, uh, on CloudFront. So infrastructure security. Let's start by talking about some of the things that we do in order to protect our, our infrastructure. Um, so this is things like physical security, how we manage our facilities, uh, how the caching uh, infrastructure works, and how the network infrastructure works. Um, here, you won't see a whole lot of stuff that you should do. This is really the stuff that's on us as we, as we operate uh, CloudFront. So security, um, just briefly go through some of the things that we do to secure the infrastructure. So one of the big things that we do is we can control very tightly who is able to access our edge infrastructure. So for engineers on our team, operators, folks who maybe have a business need to access 
uh, our systems, there's a very strict set of uh, procedures that they need to follow in order to get access to those hosts. Uh, so we use what's called bastion hosts. So this is a centralized um, point where engineers will log into. That's the only point that's allowed uh, to go and access our edge hosts. Um, in order to get access to those bastion hosts, uh, engineers must use two-factor authentication. Everything that we do is encrypted. And uh, there's a series of metrics and testing and probing that we're constantly doing in order to validate that we're following our own security best practices. Um, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on this today. Um, some of this stuff is stuff we don't uh, tend to talk about a whole lot, but really ends up providing that foundation where the infrastructure itself is secure from the facilities to the uh, cash host to the network. Moving on, I'm going to spend a little bit more time now talking about the services security. And here it will be a mixture of things that we provide by default and things that you can do in order to make your uh, website more, more secure. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about ciphers, we'll talk about perfect forward secrecy and OCSP stapling, uh, and then we'll go through some options around private content and how we can do SSL on the site. Uh, we'll go through fairly deeply on um, some web application firewall examples and some uh, examples of how you can use ACM. Uh, so CloudFront, I'm gonna start with just the, the highest level. I think this should be familiar to all of you. Uh, we're growing, uh, so every time I do this slide, the numbers increase. We are a network of 68 edge locations. Uh, we have nine regional centers. Um, these are spread across 43 cities, 21 countries, and five continents. And one of the things that is cool from a, a security perspective, all of these have a consistent security footprint. So all of the features that you're, you will see here today are available across all of our different edge locations. So there's not a trade-off between, hey, if I want to use the locations in Australia, they don't do uh, SSL the same way as the ones in the US do. Uh, all of the features are, def are deployed uniformly, so you get a um, consistent security footprint. Um, the other thing I usually start with when we start talking about security and CloudFront is that you can use CloudFront to deliver all different types of content. So folks maybe traditionally think of a CDN as accelerating static, static uh, content. Images on a website, maybe a, a JavaScript uh, page or a CSS file. Um, and CloudFront does that really well. Um, but we've also spent a bunch of time uh, investing in CloudFront's video delivery capabilities. Um, and how you can, more importantly, I think for this talk, how you can use CloudFront to deliver the dynamic portions of your site. So things like personalized content or even user input, data that you're collecting from end users on the internet, trying to bring these back safely into your applications. And you can use CloudFront to make all of those types of content more secure and more performant. So we we'll frequently get the question, well, how, does, how do you accelerate the dynamic stuff? This is stuff that can't be cached, so if a CDN is really just a big globally distributed cache, how does that, how does that help? How can I optimize the delivery of the dynamic content? Um, the short answer is that we do this by proxying data um, back over a highly optimized uh, network. So um, when an end user makes a request for a piece of content, um, we're gonna automatically uh, route that end user to the nearest edge location. Um, we're gonna maintain a high quality consistent connection from that edge location back to your origin. Um, we're gonna keep that connection alive. We're gonna use the AWS back, backbone. And then as we get into to this conversation, you'll see some of the SSL and TLS uh, optimizations that we've built. And the result of all of these things is that even when you're not caching data, even when it's completely um, uh, dynamic content, stuff that can't be cached whatsoever, or data that's coming from the um, end user back into your application in EC2 or wherever it may live, we can help accelerate that and make it more secure. So how do we protect data in transit? This is probably the right place to start. Um, the best way and where we'll spend a lot of time today is talking about our options for doing uh, HTTPS delivery. Um, and we have options that will, uh, 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 Basis, I guess basically the place to start is we will start by terminating SSL at our edge locations. So the, conver the conversation between the user request and the edge location is gonna be secured using uh, an HTTPS uh, certificate. 
We're going to authenticate the, those viewers. And then we're going to also make a similarly secure, uh, depending on your configuration, make a similarly secure connection back to your origin also using uh, HTTPS. So let's go into that, uh, that TLS section and focus in more detail on, on both the, some of the trends that we see in the industry and what CloudFront can do. So a little bit of history on, on SSL and TLS. Um, SSL started in the mid-90s. Um, we see an a, a evolution of web encryption technologies over you know, really the, the 10 or 15 years um, between 1995 and um, I guess we can call 2008 a milestone when TLS 1.2 is released. Um, the interesting thing happened um, 2014 was probably a, um, a big milestone for me. There was some before that. But um, really, you see a battle against uh, encryption vulnerabilities. So I remember when Heartbleed came out, I was at a conference actually here in Las Vegas. And we all got on a phone. We figured out how we're going to figure out uh, a mitigation to that. Um, and we saw that again with Poodle. And so AWS spends a tremendous amount of time figuring out how we're going to successfully uh, battle these vulnerabilities. And that's really a trend that we see in the industry. Uh, the other thing that comes as a result is that industry enforcement is increasingly um, focused on providing great uh, or mandating great encryption technologies. So um, there's been a bunch of changes around how PCI compliance, what things you need to do in order to maintain PCI compliance with your SSL configuration. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Apple's mandatory ATS uh, standards and um, how uh, HSTS is increasingly being required by uh, various industry standards or, or even, even application vendors. And as a result, what we see is more and more developers are using HTTPS for everything. 100% of your site, 100% of the content uh, delivered over uh, HTTPS. When we started CloudFront in 2008, we didn't even offer any SSL options. Now um, I see more and more customers doing this for just everything by default. We think that's a good pattern and uh, one that we're going to talk about here today. Um, let's start, look, start by looking at uh, some of the security services, uh, the services security layer. I'm going to start by having Craig take you through some of the things that we do automatically. So these are things you don't configure but that you get by default by being a, a CloudFront customer. Thanks, right? Alex. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, how CloudFront is set up to do SSL today. This is the stuff you get for free. It's, just, it's built in. Um, you don't have to think about any of this stuff. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, how we improve security, our Cypher suites, look at perfect forward secrecy. Uh, I'm going to talk about performance, because uh, the performance of TLS, because this really needs to be an and decision. You can't be secure or or fast, you need to be secure and fast. Uh, so this is, we'll start by taking a look at uh, in a TLS handshake. Uh, so after you've established a TCP connection, you're gonna establish a TLS session. Uh, and so this works by the client sends a, a hello message, the server then responds with its own hello message and the certificate that's gonna be used. Uh, there's then a key exchange that happens uh, and the server can respond to that and say agree that yes, now we, we're now secure, we now are, everything that is going over the wire now is encrypted. Uh, and that allows you then to send your HTTP request. And so from then on, everything within the TLS tunnel or the TLS connection is just standard HTTP. Uh, so we've, we've done a couple things. We've looked at the Cypher suites. Uh, we've done some benchmarking. We've done some security analysis. Uh, and we're set up so that we prefer, we have a, a list of preferred Cyphers. We've, we've ordered them in a way that we think is, is right for performance and is right for security. Um, and so everybody who turns on TLS with CloudFront just gets the, the, the state of the art. Um, the other thing that the Cypher list that we picked uh, enables perfect sort forward secrecy. Uh, one of the properties of perfect forward secrecy is if somebody does happen to compromise your certificate and get out your private key, they cannot use that to look back in time at traffic that they have captured in the past and decrypt that. Very important property for uh, any encrypted communication. So there's two sides to this. There is the connection from the client to CloudFront, and then from CloudFront to the origin. Uh, so what we will do is we can use HTTPS from CloudFront to your origin as well. Uh, we will validate 
the certificate is, you know, it's the right the certificate for the name we expect it to talk to. We'll validate that it comes from a trusted CA. Uh, we'll look at the time windows. We'll do, you know, we'll be a, pr a proper client implementing everything that is as, uh, following best practices. Um, so everything so far is, is, I think, just kind of, you know, how TLS works. I want to dive into the, the performance aspects of it. Um, so here's the, uh, the handshake again. I'm going to talk about session tickets. So what a session ticket is, is um, you notice that we've, we have to do two round trips for the client to establish a TCP connection. This is after, or it's TLS connection, excuse me. This is after the TCP connection. So it's a total of three tr round trips. Uh, all this stuff that I've talked about, you can do yourself and you can do in a single location, but round trips are expensive. This is, adds a fair bit of latency for every new connection that you establish. By doing this in the CDN, we are close to the end users, and so this multiple round trip penalty we can eliminate by doing things uh, more efficiently, as I'm going to talk about. But just by being the nature of a CDN being close to the end users, the round trip time is also minimized. Uh, but so a session ticket is after we've negotiated the, the TLS connection, we've agreed on the parameters that we're going to use to, uh, for this uh, encrypted uh, connection, uh, we can return uh, a ticket which contains some encrypted data that describes the negotiation we just completed. The client can then uh, remember this ticket, and on subsequent connections, in the client hello message can include, hey, here's the ticket. We've, we've talked before. This is what we negotiated. Uh, when the server sees this, it can look at it, can decrypt the ticket, and say, yes, this is a valid ticket. We've already negotiated it, and then uh, return a finished message immediately, and so we can eliminate one round trip. Um, TCP fast open is a, is a very similar technique. Uh, this is a much newer thing. Uh, not all clients support this yet, but it's coming. Uh, CloudFront does support this in the case uh, where you're connecting over TLS. It's a very similar idea in that you, know, you send the SYN uh, packet to establish a TCP connection, server responds with a SYN ACK, and we can, again, we can return a cookie that just you know, describes this, the nature of the connection to, so we can know that we've connected before. The client can then return this to us in a subsequent connection, and when giving us the cookie, can also include uh, data about what's to come next, and so can send the client hello message at the same time as the, the SYN uh, packet, and so can eliminate one round trip. So we've gone from three round trips to one round trip, which just means that you get your data faster. Uh, another thing that we have to look at is, um, as a client, you want to make sure that you're talking to a valid certificate. Uh, as somebody who owns a certificate, something may happen to your certificate, you may change it, you may change your name, the certificate may become compromised, and so you're going to want to revoke that certificate. And so the client really needs to know that the certificate that he's, uh, is, is being used for this TLS connection is still valid. Uh, so OCSP stapling is, is a great way to do this. Um, CloudFront implements this for you. Uh, when the client sends a hello message to CloudFront, CloudFront will then go and talk to an OCSP responder, validate that the certificate is still valid. We can then cache that response and so that multiple uh, Multiple connections can benefit from this one check, uh, and then we'll return the, the validation information back to the client so the client knows that it's, everything's okay. Um, we did some benchmarking. Uh, we actually instrumented a client. This was not done with a browser, but was done with a, uh, a test client we set up. Um, and so you can see here the, the time taken for a TCP handshake, the client hello, the server hello, uh, and then the, the top line there, you see the client is doing its own revocation check. So the client now has to talk to the OCSP responder itself which means a new DNS lookup, a new TCP connection, uh, the round trip for the OCSP message. Um, contrast that to OCSP stapling, where uh, CloudFront is able to contact things on your behalf, which use the, uh, the cache state. Uh, the difference is actually about 120 milliseconds, which is a 30% improvement, uh, which translates to faster page loads and uh, better engagement, better sales, whatever it is that your website is doing. Uh, so this is just one of the, the standards coming out that requ requires a bunch of these uh, TLS features. Um, Apple's ATS standards are going to be required January 2017. If you use CloudFront, you already meet all these standards. Um, I'm going to pass this back over to Alex now to talk about uh, features that you can enable for CloudFront. Cool. Thanks, Craig. Um, as you said, the, fir the first set of things that Craig just went through are things that you get by default. I'm going to go through some things that you can configure, have a little bit of choice over, uh, try to talk a little bit about the pros and cons and why you might want to configure in one fashion or another. 
Um, so these are things, uh, a lot of it will be around TLS, um, but we'll also go through um, private content and trusted signers, uh, and then AWS WAF and uh, certificate manager. Um, I guess the punchline, sort of starting with the answer, is that we've tried very hard to make it very easy for cu uh, customers, developers, to do the right thing um, when using HTTPS. And uh, where this starts is giving customers the option to use a single CloudFront domain name to deliver both HTTP and HTTPS content. And um, with that as a starting point, we give you options to um, require folks to use HTTPS. Uh, so there's two flavors on that. Uh, you can configure to uh, uh, strictly enforce HTTPS or redirect from one to the other. Um, so uh, strict HTTPS is just what it sounds like. So if, if we get an HTTP uh, request, uh, we, we'll fail it. Um, what we see more developers doing is uh, using our, our redirect to HTTPS. So if a request comes in on an HTTP connection, we're going to immediately uh, redirect to the same object over an HTTPS connection, um, forcing a more secure uh, connection. So I see developers using that uh, very frequently. Um, there are three big options in terms of certificates and domain names. Um, as, as I said, one of the big advantages of CloudFront is you can use a single domain name across your whole site, um, and that will push us into, I think, the second and the third option that we'll talk about here. But uh, the first one is you can use the default cloudfront.net domain name. Uh, you can use that um, uh, um, over SSL, or sorry, TLS. Um, it will have a non-human friendly domain name. So, you know, d123456.cloudfront.net. Um, so it's more frequently used for customers who are embedding CloudFront in a site that they manage elsewhere. Um, but it's free, and so we see customers do that. And originally, it was the only option. Uh, we've since added two additional ones that tend to get used more for that whole site uh, delivery concept. Um, the first is SNI-based custom SSL. So here, you bring your own certificate, so it can be um, you know, mysite.com, you upload it into um, the AWS uh, uh, infrastructure, and um, we select the right cert based on the uh, SNI extension, the server name indication extension of the TLS protocol. And um, that tells us, are we going to serve um, your, basically your cert or someone else's, serve the right cert for the right customer? And um, the, the pro of this is it allows you to use your own domain name, your own certificate, and it's free of charge. Um, so it sounds great. Why, why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, it's a, uh, a more modern extension. So if you have clients, it tends to be like Windows XP clients, some early versions of Android. Uh, they don't support this uh, uh, SNI extension to TLS. Um, so if what you're interested in is getting my own certificate with maximum coverage, we have a third option, and that's dedicated IP SSL. Uh, like SNI custom SSL with dedicated IP SSL, uh, you bring your own SSL certificate, um, um, and we uh, will host it for you. Um, but what we'll do with dedicated IP, kind of like the name suggests, we will allocate your own IP range in each of our edge locations. And we'll use that IP address in order to identify um, what um, certificate to use. So if it comes in on 1.2.3.4, I know I need to serve the www.mysite.com uh, address. This works on any client, new or old. So it gives you great coverage, great availability. However, as you can imagine, with 60-something edge locations and growing, and we're giving you your own IP space in each one of those, uh, IP space is dear. Uh, there's cost to, to us, um, so there's expense uh, to that. So this is a, uh, enabling this option is um, an extra charge on your uh, AWS uh, account. So those are the three different options for, for TLS uh, with, with CloudFront. Let's talk a little bit about getting that certificate and what we've done with uh, uh, AWS Certificate Manager. Um, the goal with Certificate Manager is really to make it easy for customers to provision, manage, deploy, and renew their TLS certificates 
on the AWS platform. So um, the, basically the way it works is that you go directly into the AWS Management Console in order to procure um, your uh, new certificate. We're able to turn that around in minutes and immediately associate it with either your CloudFront distribution or your ELB load balancer, if it says it's for your, for your origin. Um, the SNI support there is free, so um, uh, it, it, it's a great combination. You can do this all for free, which is pretty cool. And uh, we automatically manage uh, renewals for you. And so from time to time, we would see customers before we had ACM forget to renew their certificates. That becomes an availability problem when the certificate is no longer val uh, valid. Um, ACM takes care of that for you. So basically the workflow before, it was a very manual process. So in order to um, provide, get, get your own certificate, you would you know, sometimes literally pick up a phone, but you would or, you know, go to a, a third party website. It was a very manual process to do the validation. You then had to upload it through a CLI and then manually connect it to CloudFront. Uh, with ACM, it's all a very simple process, takes minutes to do um, just simple mouse clicks within the AWS Management Console. And as I said, we will manage all of the renewal um, uh, for you. So there's not the risk of the cert expiring unexpectedly. Um, going back to configuration options with CloudFront, there's two models that we see um, for SSL termination. Um, if you remember back to the picture of the retail website that we showed um, at the beginning, um, there's some content there that's not inherently secure, um, but is delivered on a page that you want to be secure. So for example, your company logo, there's nothing inherently secure about that. But if you're including it on a, on a web page that also um, um, includes uh, secure content, things that you do need to secure, it's beneficial to deliver that entire uh, all the objects on that page uh, under an SSL connection. And um, if you don't do that, actually, browsers will tend to throw warnings to your users saying this is an insecure site and that scares people. I uh, can't really explain, well, it's just my logo that's not secure. Uh, it's better to just deliver it all. So that model, we see customers using what we call half bridge um, uh, HTTPS, uh, so where you will secure uh, the connection between the end, edge location and the end user using SSL, um, but not secure the connection back to your origin. So you don't need to, you know, for your logo, if I say it's in, in S3 or if it's on your ELB, um, you don't need to necessarily secure that. So that's half bridge termination. Uh, for full bridge termination, you will secure the entire chain. So we will terminate uh, the initial SSL connection at the edge location and then make a separate uh, SSL connection back or TLS connection back to uh, the region um, uh, creating a full bridge of encryption all the way. So as I alluded to, the, the benefits of half bridge termination is that you get better performance on uh, connections to the origin. Uh, the full bridge uh, TLS termination secures your content all the way through. So if you're collecting data from a user, if you're showing them personal information, you're gonna wanna use that full bridge. Um, the specific setting that you will use um, for this is the um, match viewer HTTPS um, uh, only um, uh, connection. So if you require SSL between the edge location and the end user and then tell uh, CloudFront to match the viewer, um, basically go back to your origin using uh, the same protocol as the end user connection is, that will accomplish that. You can also specify that I just want CloudFront to always go to my origin using uh, HTTPS no matter what. Both of those uh, settings will accomplish um, um, a full bridge uh, termination. We talked a lot about TLS, I'm gonna step out of that. Uh, security is not only about encryption, it's also about access control. Um, so imagine you're uh, trying to do a pay, uh, sell a digital asset online. You wanna verify that you're only delivering that digital asset to customers who have paid you. Um, CloudFront has a variety of different uh, options that allow you to um, limit who's able to download an option either to specific customers or over a period of time or to a particular part of your network. 
Um, so uh, we call this feature private content. Uh, there's two options for private content. Uh, the first is using a signed URL. Uh, so what signed URLs do is you create a policy file. Uh, we'll see one of these in a second. But basically, it specifies the conditions under which you want a request to be served. Uh, you sign it using a, a private key. We have the public key, um, uh, half of that key. And uh, then you append that to your URL as a query string parameter. When we get a request, we look at the signature, uh, say it's a valid signature, we serve the request. If it's not a valid signature, we don't. And what this is very useful for is restricting access to individual files. So if you're selling that uh, digital download and you want to make sure that it's only delivered to a paid user, you could append a signed URL to it and we'll use that to, uh, to, to validate it. Um, signed cookies is a very similar uh, process, but rather than appending the signature and the policy as a query string parameter, you embed it in a cookie. And uh, the advantage of that is your URLs don't change. Um, so um, the page that is creating your set of URLs doesn't have to know whether a user is, um, it doesn't have to change with a different query string parameter. You can use the same URLs um, uh, to restrict access to multiple files. So we see customers doing this for video use cases for uh, Dash or HLS delivery. Uh, for folks who aren't in the video business, these are what are called fragmented or segmented uh, video delivery file, uh, formats, where you have a manifest of um, video fragments, each of which might be five or 10 seconds of video. And it would be a pain in the neck to sign each one of those um, uh, individual fragments for a two hour movie. So rather than that, you can place a single cookie that contains your policy file and use it to uh, authorize your user to access all, all of those video fragments. Uh, none of your URLs need to change. So what does a policy file look like? Um, there's basically th uh, three or four uh, parts to it. Um, the first is the resource. So the resource is just the URL or the path pattern that you're trying to uh, protect or authorize. Um, the second is a set of conditions. Um, there's really two parts to a condition. Uh, the first is a time period. So you can say, I want this URL to be only valid between start and end. Those are optional, so you can have an end time and a start time and leave out the other one um, to, to create, or you can use them in combination. And then the last part is IP addresses. Um, uh, these can be uh, down to the, the 32 level, or you can uh, use CIDR notation to uh, allow or uh, entire range. One of the patterns we see customers use for URL, uh, sorry, uh, IP ranges is uh, using this to test your site. So you can use this in conjunction with our cookie-based auth to say, I only want, for now, uh, to make this uh, site available to my own uh, internal IP range. And so that way you can test and use CloudFront to verify that the site is behaving the way you want it to um, before you um, make it public for everyone. Um, we have four uh, provided for customers a server serverless signed URL generator. So you can find this on the AWS website, which makes it super easy to uh, create these uh, signed URLs. I'm um, going to go over to AWS WAF for a little bit. And this starts with saving you money. I don't know if saving you money is always the first thing I would start off. There's a bunch of different reasons why you may want to put more sophisticated um, access rules uh, in place to control who's able to uh, access your content. So in this example, the customer is concerned about not spending money to serve scraper bots. And so um, uh, uh, here we have a user agent that's bad bots. You know, in reality, they're not going to be that explicit. Um, but we can use web application firewall, AWS WAF, in order to pr uh, prohibit um, those uh, user agents from accessing your CloudFront distribution while allowing your good users to come in uh, without any problem. So we built AWS WAF really as a developer tool. And I think this is one of the things that makes um, AWS uh, WAF unique in the space. 
uh, is we really came at it from what would a developer want to do in terms of a programming model to protect their website and control who's able to use it. So here's an example of a customer who is using AWS WAF to protect their site from bots. Um, so what they're doing is they've created a closed loop process where pulling down actual access logs um, from CloudFront and other systems to say, what are the patterns that I see in my actual traffic? Running that through a threat analysis pattern and using that to update the rules that they have in place on their live site. And um, we've built AWS WAF not only with that programmatic API, but also with very fast change propagation time. So you can push a rule, uh, a new rule to uh, AWS WAF in about 30 seconds and have it take effect. So Craig's gonna actually take you through an example of that. Um, we'll do a live demo of showing how you can use AWS WAF to create that uh, uh, closed loop process to dynamically block bad bots. Thanks, Alex. Yep, so we're gonna block some bad bots. And so what we need is we need three things. Uh, we need the IP set, which is gonna be the, the set of IPs from these bad bots, the, people that we, the, the bots that we want to block. Uh, we need to have a rule blocks these, the IPs that match the IP set, and we need a web ACL, which allows requests in by default, but if you happen to match the rule, then you'll be blocked. There's two other things that we need, though. We need a mechanism to detect bad bots, and we also need a mechanism to add the bad bot's IP address to the IP set. Uh, what I'm gonna describe is kind of a simplistic way to detect uh, bad bots, but it, it actually can work. Uh, so when a crawler is indexing your website, uh, it'll typically look at the robots.txt file, which is in the, the root of your website, and it will follow the instructions there, and a, a good crawler, like you know, Googlebot or, or Bing's crawler, um, will respect this and will not go to those pages that are excluded. Bad bot might not, and bad bot might be looking for other things that you don't want uh, indexed, and this is what you're, the behavior you're trying to block. Uh, and so what you can do is you can actually you set up, the, uh, and the demo we're gonna show you is gonna set up the, uh, the robots.txt, create a honeypot address, so anybody that actually accesses this honeypot is not respecting robots.txt and probably is a bad bot. Um, in order for the crawler to find it, we're gonna add a, a hidden link somewhere on the site so a human wouldn't see it because it's not gonna be rendered in the DOM, uh, but a crawler will see it. Uh, uh, so what we'll do is uh, when we see somebody accessing the honeypot, we will go then and update WAF. And so on the, the side here, you can see the AWS CLI invocations that we can do this, this procedure by hand. So we get a change token. We then uh, use the change token to change that IP set uh, with the IP address that we just got. Um, and then uh, the web app will be updated. And so I'm actually going to demonstrate this for you. Uh, so we have a, a website here, it's Quacky Nature. Uh, this is uh, the world's best site for buying uh, rubber ducks, or at least that's what I was told. I would have gone to Amazon first, but that's just me. Um, so you can see I can load this, and the, the website comes up just fine. Um, this test link is, uh, in the real site, it would be hidden, so this would be that hidden URL. And so if I go here, uh, I will load this. Uh, and so it says, hey, we've got this, this new blocked IP. Okay, so this, is, this change is now propagating out to the, the WAF. And so if I go and I'll open a new tab, kakinature.com, and we'll see that I was actually successfully blocked. So my IP is now considered a bad bot. Uh, and I'll pass it back over to Alex. Cool, thanks Craig. Um, so that was live, that was you know real, it was a very simple example. There are a bunch of more conf uh, complex and uh, intricate rules that are available. Um, take a look at our website. So here's a URL for uh, some pre-configured rules that are available. Um, there's also some sample code that is available on the AWS website that will um, walk you through that closed loop process, that process of taking CloudFront access logs, bringing them into an analytics system, making a decision around it, and uh, then updating your WAF rules. So one of the ones that we have a tutorial around is um, uh, putting in automatic um, blocks against IP addresses that make more requests than you would expect a human being to make on, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so this is all on our website. Please, t please take a look. So um, I guess the last bit 
is we've talked a lot about protecting your CloudFront assets and using AWS WAF to control who's a and private content to control who's able to access your CloudFront distribution. Um, that still leaves a potential opening, which is your origin. So let's talk a little bit about how we can control access to your origin. We have two models with CloudFront, um, and they differ based on whether it's an Amazon S3 origin or a custom origin. Uh, so for Amazon S3, if the original content is stored in an S3 bucket, we have a feature called origin access identities. Basically, these are limited purpose S3 rights that give uh, CloudFront, your specific CloudFront distribution, access to a particular bucket or a particular object. And so it's a way for you to say, I only want CloudFront, this CloudFront distribution to be able to get at this bucket or this object. And um, it's, you can figure this through the AWS Management Console. Um, for custom origins, um, because you don't have that uh, S3 um, OAI concept, we recommend uh, a two-stage approach. Uh, the first stage is that we recommend that you protect your origin against, um, uh, sorry, you only allow your origin to accept CloudFront, uh, accept connections from CloudFront's IP space. And then second, we recommend that you add a shared secret between your CloudFront distribution and your origin. So let's walk through those briefly. Um, this, the S3 origin access identity model um, is, is very simple. So basically, when we get a request from an end user, um, we go back to S3 using a uh, limited purpose S3 identity. Uh, the, the object is, a lot, if uh, S3 is configured to only allow the CloudFront distribution uh, access there, if a user tries to access your bucket without going through the CloudFront distribution, it will fail. <coughs> Um, protecting custom origins, um, as I said, there's two parts to this. So the first part is creating a whitelist of, um, of CloudFront's IP space. What that does is it says, I only want um, CloudFront to be able to access my origin. Now, that's good. That's a big step in the right direction, but it's incomplete. Because what it doesn't do is it allow you to say, I only want this distribution that I control to access my origin. Um, if, all, if I stopped here, this would allow any CloudFront distribution to access your origin. So the second part is to add what's called, the feature is custom headers to the origin, um, but you can create a shared secret um, and include this as a header that CloudFront will inject on every origin request. Do that over a TLS connection, and that way your origin will know that it is uh, all, not only CloudFront making the request, but your specific CloudFront distribution. And so that way, if someone tries to access your origin uh, directly, uh, that will fail. To make it a little bit easy for you, um, we have an SNS topic you can subscribe to to get notification on the uh, changes to our IP space. And um, there's uh, CloudFront samples around automatically updating your security groups to, to make this all work. Um, other origin best practices, we'll take you through these briefly. There's six of them that we'll talk about. Um, I talked about this earlier, matching the viewer origin protocol um, policy and enabling a uh, TLS uh, connection to the origin. So this will ensure that every connection is, uh, to your origin is secured using uh, TLS. Second, I just talked about restricting access using a shared secret and a uh, security group. Uh, third, use a SHA-256 certificate. Um, fourth, um, you can see a, uh, just as we talked about using ACM to um, uh, uh, configure your viewer facing cert, you can also use ACM uh, to configure your, the cert that's running on your ELB. Uh, there's fifth, a bunch of predefined policies in ELB that can provide additional uh, security. And sixth, we recommend that you add a uh, HSTS header uh, to your uh, origins uh, re request, your origin responses. This will tell browsers that when in, you access this site in the future, always use uh, a, a TLS connection. 
Um, if you do all of this, um, th this will give, this is a, a real example, you will be able to, as Craig said, meet many of the increasingly stringent standards that um, uh, various uh, industry groups and um, uh, best practices recommend. Uh, thank you. Wanted to just do a couple of uh, where to go from here for additional help. Um, we hold CloudFront office hours uh, the last Tuesday of every month. Um, this is a, being the end of the year is non-standard. We have one on December 13th at 10 a.m. You can register at the URL that's on the screen. Uh, please join us so that we try to get questions and get folks engaged. So it's really a good chance for you to engage with the engineers who are building CloudFront and get, get help. Uh, second, there's a, a series of white papers that are available. Uh, this is a, uh, w there's a white paper version, basically, of this talk uh, that you can download. download. Finally, a couple of additional sessions that are uh, coming up. Uh, we have a session on how we do DevOps in uh, the AWS Edge Services team. And then finally, um, uh, we'll have some of our engineers and managers talk um, about best practices for configuring, securing, and monitoring your CloudFront distribution. So with that, thank you. I'll stick around for a little bit. If any questions, um, please come up, but I appreciate the time here today.